So the last speaker in this session we'll have is uh, Sarv Chandra from Ames in Delhi. He's come probably the furthest here. Um, but uh, very busy at what practice there and uh, has the Rosa robot and is interested for endoscopy. Doing very interesting things. He's going to talk to you about that. Thank you very much, Shen. It's indeed a great uh, uh, pleasure to be here, sharing my experience. So uh, these are some of the disclosures. So most of the research, what we have published, is part of the Center of Excellence for Epilepsy and Epilepsy Research and the MEP Center. We have done over 2,000 cases and published over 200 papers. And in our uh, epilepsy practice, we acquired a ROSA system in the year 2016. And of course, we started using it for SCE like all the other centers, but later on I tried to find other applications and I found that uh, the, the system can also uh, come up as a very nice holding device. So we devised various endoscopic techniques like endoscopic hemispherotomies, corpus callosotomies with uh, hemispherotomies and later, later we use this for other applications, non-epilepsy applications like pituitary surgery or retroventricular tumors. And in our center, we developed a technique of doing radio frequency ablations for hypochromic chromatomas using a co registration of OA with the robotic system, which I presented very recently at the ESTM meeting in Vienna, and we published it uh, with an involuntary research recently. So, uh, the earlier speakers have discussed very elegantly the advantages and disadvantages. But specifically as an endoscopic holder in the current uh, technology for the system what we use, I think the best advantage is that it provides you a spectrum of wide range and motion of movements. So you could have six types of movements and three types of speed. But it's a very stable holder for an endoscope. Of course, it won't double up like an uh, assistant. What is used for pituitary surgery who would kind of go along with your surgery, but definitely it provides a very stable holding system so that both your hands could be free to do a very delicate surgeries. Uh, it kind of gives an haptic feedback. It's not exactly an haptic feedback. I will, just, I will be discussing it a bit later. But definitely, uh, it, it, it uh, does not allow your hands to get exhausted as it would be with the routine uh, endoscopic holders. Uh, the uh, disadvantages, what I found is that obviously it doesn't um, perform inputs like an assistant, I mean the, the scope wouldn't come out or wouldn't move in and you have to move it manually. And sometimes I found that the robot tend to freeze and then we have to reboot, which could be an issue, but I think it's a software related problems and it go away once more developments uh, take place. So uh, this is how I use it. I attach it to an endoscope holder and you can see I'm in the inter-endospheric area performing an endosporotomy. And it gives me a very smooth uh, and a stable workflow pattern so that both my hands are uh, free. And when I move it, uh, it kind of goes along with the intended direction. So that's the reason I call it as an haptic feedback. So if you see the definition of haptic feedback, it says that use of the sense of touch in user interface device to provide information to the end users. So the typical ha haptic feedback, what we have is the vibration, sense of vibration for mobiles or for force feedback in joysticks. The reason I have used haptic feedback for this is that when we move it, the whole weight doesn't actually fall into the hands of the surgeon. And somehow it's able to judge the feedback from the hand and moves in the intended direction. And it enables the surgeon to use just one hand. So the other hand is completely free and once it goes there, you can go ahead and do your surgeries. And I feel that it, enhance, it has an element of enhanced safety by preventing any damage to the vital structures. So when you're operating very uh, delicate surgeries or very intensive uh, surgeries like hemispherotomy where you have to dissect very delicate structures, it does uh, help you quite a lot in that area. So it's very important to have optical ergonomics while doing the surgeries because uh, uh, you wouldn't like to get exhausted at the end of the surgery. So this is how I like to fit the robotic scope, uh, robot with the endoscope. So it's very important, I use the long endoscope so that I have plenty of space to have both the suction and the bipolar on either side. The line of vision should be, should be optimal. As you age, if this line of vision is not optimal, you could end up getting severe neck pains. Uh, I prefer to sit in a good operating chair, so the line of gravity should be very optimal.
optimally suited for your spine and there should be a good elbow support. So briefly speaking, we have used endo endoscopic integration for the following techniques. Starting with the technique which we described where we have a technique of performing uh, endoscopic hemispherotomy. And we developed this technique uh, way back, more than six years back, somewhere in the year 2010, we started doing these procedures. So initially it looked very exotic, but uh, when we started integrating, the idea was sounded as easy as trying to pass uh, this creature through the eye of the needle. Uh, but it does give you a sense of logic because uh, hemispherotomy is primarily a surgery which is performed for kids and it's very important to be minimally invasive, have as less blood loss as possible and also uh, avoid hypothermia by performing large craniotomies. Uh, recently the first ever RCT which our center has performed for kids has shown that the difference between surgically operated kids and medically treated kids is as much as 10 times. And not only that, uh, the secondary outcomes are also very, very significant in children who undergo surgery versus who are only treated med medically. So we know that hemispherotomy has got one of the best outcomes for epilepsy. And because of the fact that it's mostly done in children, and it's, uh, it's logical that we should develop techniques which are more minimally invasive, has less of blood loss, and also avoids hypothermia by performing large craniotomies, which is a standard of practice currently. So when we develop this technique, this is what we do currently. We have an opening which is about four centimeters in the sagittal diameter, three centimeters in the transverse diameter. And unlike the vertical technique described by Professor Dillalan, we have a much more anterior trajectory. The reason he went parasagittal is because he goes right at the level of coronal suture or the motor strip where you have a lot of bridging veins. But using the endoscope, it could have a much more anteriorly placed trajectory, which would avoid the bridging veins. And it could, using the scope, it could go up right up to the posterior most part of the reception, which is the splenium. We published our first uh, paper in 2010 in neurosurgery, and later on, it has been incorporated as one of the four accepted techniques for hemispherotomy. And more recently, we are going to come up with a consolidated series in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. And hopefully we should have this image on the journal's cover page. Now what we do is we use a technique of hybrid endoscopic assistant using the robot. So you have the three fundamental techniques of endoscope. Here you have the exoscope, uh, which is very easy, easy to use for the surgeon because it has a very uh, shallow learning curve. Uh, but the biggest disadvantage is that most of the light dissipates on the surface. So most of the light doesn't actually go where you have the target, which is uh, from the level of genu to the splenium when you're doing endoscopic hemispherotomies. Uh, now in the traditional scopes, you have scopes which are four millimeters thick, but again, these are not suitable because it's okay when the target is small like a pituitary, but when you're doing an endoscopic hemispherotomy, the target is really quite big and you need to have a thicker scope. So currently we use something uh, like this, which is a 10 millimeter scope. It's a very long scope. The scope goes inside but doesn't actually reach up to the target. So that's the reason we call it as an hybrid endoscopic assistance. And you can go right up to the target by just increasing the magnification. But because the scope is inside the cranial opening, you get an excellent visualization. So these are the few cases which we started off initially. This is an atrophic case, and this is a post-op. You can see the disconnection. And then we went on to uh, Rasmussen's, which are not so atrophic. And once again, post-op, you can see the disconnection, how it's happened here. And currently we do it for all cases of hemispheric disconnection. This is a hemispheric cortical dysplasia and you can see the fine line of disconnection which has been made here uh, using the robotic endoscopic system and you can see that there's hardly any trauma to the adjacent structures. And this is another example. This is immediate post-op in the brain suite and you can see the deception which is there. And after one year there is a deafferentation atrophy and you can see the excellent disconnection over here. So I will briefly show you the video. I know I don't have much time, but fundamentally we do a corpus callosotomy and then we do an anterior disconnection which goes up to the spinard bridge and this dotted yellow line is a temporal horn and then we enter the temporal horn to finish the middle disconnection and then we have the posterior disconnection. So uh, this is how briefly the... So that's the size of the opening. So the whole thing is under endoscope. So you can 
actually magnify it or decrease the magnification. Uh, so uh, it provides a wonderful perspective. Now the scope has gone just through the cranial opening, but we are not at the target. So we're reaching the target just by increasing the magnification. So that is a corpus callosum, and now you're separating both the tubes and you start the corpus callosotomy right from the front to the splenial disconnection, the back. Now from the splenium we go to the genome, where we start doing the anterior disconnection, which is at the junction of the genome and the etus, and this goes right up to the base of the skull. So people who are interested can see these videos on the YouTube, they're already there on the YouTube, so it goes down right at the anterior fossa, and then we start with the middle disconnection, which is lateral, to the, caudate, uh, to the caudate nucleus and then to the thalamus and goes down vertically to join the temporal horn and that's the end of the procedure. So you can see the visualization is really excellent and the robotic holder provides an excellent stable feedback. So you can move it any number of times without your hands getting exhausted and that's the scope coming out. So in our series, endoscopic hemisprotum has had an equivalent outcome as open but in addition, we have had much significantly less blood loss as well as post-operative state. And the visualization, of course, is excellent. And then we went ahead to describe the technique of endoscopic corpus callosotomy with commissure of name for a series of kids who were, were having Lennox distort with severe cognitive retardation. And they were having hundreds of seizures. So when we performed a complete corpus callosotomy through an endoscopic route, along with pan commissure which included anterior commissure, hippocampal commissure, and also posterior commissure for the first time in the literature. We have had much better outcomes in this group of patients. Why posterior commissure, I don't have time to explain, but of course, if somebody asks me the question, I can tell more details. Then we extended the system for other non-epilepsy indications like pituitary surgery. So I can show you a brief video. So in, in pituitary surgery, because we don't have the option of the uh, assistant providing you that dynamic endoscopic view. So we adopted for a transseptal approach, which actually worked out very well. So that's the nasal cavity being inspected. So we make a small incision on the nasal septum and we create a tunnel. And this is all done using roboto robotic endoscopic uh, assistance. And we retract it gently. And then we go down right up to the keel of the woman. So fundamentally, it's like a, a microscopic TNTS, but we are using an endoscope and the opening is much less. So uh, removing the keel of the woman and exposing the uh, sphenoid sinus and uh, opening the cella as a plate and that could be replaced at the end. Removing the tumor and that's the end of the surgery. And at the end of the surgery, we just stitch the mucosa back uh, to the nasal mucosa. So there's one stitch which is applied here. So at the end of surgery, we don't have to put any pledges or anything and the hemostasis is uh, very good. So that's it. So we have one suture where the mucosa is sutured and the opening is very, very minimally invasive. So a few examples, this is a large cranium which we did with robotic assistance. We have to phase it. So this is second stage and the third stage has been removed completely. Similarly, giant tumors, we have to stage it. I think sometimes it's better to stage it. And our experience of robotic assistance for pituitaries has been about 28 cases. So then for intraventricular tumors, so with an experience of hemispherotomies, we thought we could use either an interhemispheric approach or a transcortical approach for large intraventricular tumors. So I can show you a few videos on this. So, uh, so this is a case of a large cavernoma, which was there. So uh, just over the corpus callosum, so we went to the interhemispheric route, again using the endoscopic robotic holder with this technique same as described for hemispherotomy. So exposing the corpus callosum. And I use dynamic uh, retraction using bipolar inception, so I never use the brain retractors, the tumor being dissected out. And then finally removed. So this is an example for a large meningioma which we use for a transcortical approach. So again, the opening is just three to three centimeters. So you can see it's a huge meningioma, so we approach from here. So 
So make a small transcortical opening. So as soon as we go in, the meningeum is highly vascular and we start dissecting the tumor. And then we use QSA and all the while, we are able to have excellent visualization with the endoscope attached to the robot. So using the QSA, the meningeum is very, very uh, tough and hard, but can be taken out with the QSA and that's the end of the surgery, which is attached to the parotid plexus. It was a parotid plexus arising from the parotid plexus. And that's the post-op MRI. So we have done uh, about 86 cases of intraventricular tumors using robotic assistance. So concluding, a robotic system currently can function as an excellent endoscopic holder. It provides excellent stability, gives a very good haptic feedback. I'm not saying that you buy it only for endoscopic assistance, but if you already have a robot, you can extend these applications also as an endoscopic holder. So it gives you complete options of uh, intensity of velocity as well as range in motions. Personally, it has allowed me to extend my surgical capabilities of developing new techniques like endoscopic hemispherotomies, allosotomies. Now I use it for pituitary tumors, then for intraventricular tumors. So I feel that my uh, area of surgical expertise is increasing when I'm using this tool more and more. Of course, the downside is that it's expensive, it's bulky, limitations of quantum and quality of movements, and last but not the least, we have to understand that it is still a beauty. So for those of you who would like to come and attend the International Society of Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery Congress, which is still far away, it's being held in the beautiful city of Udaipur in India. So all of you are welcome. And this is the palace where it's going to be held. And epilepsy definitely is going to be one of the strong points uh, for this conference. Thank you very much. Uh, questions. We, uh, we have five, ten minutes before we go to lunch. So questions are just going to be a little bit very good. I had a question to the previous speaker from uh, about the uh, MOSA. And the question is, you showed that the uh, learning curve was short. The, and, I, and I didn't understand exactly the